Hey, welcome to New Hunter Church of Christ. We are doing the morning service uh, for our church. We have midday service on Sunday and recording this today because we did not um, have any people on Sunday. Uh, last Sunday we did not, but normally we do have some people or we have viewership. We didn't have any, but we're getting this out to you and we're talking from Romans chapter 3 is our text. Romans chapter 3 verses 21 through 26. And the title of the sermon is Standing on Leveled Ground. And basically what that means is that we will all one day stand on level grounds before our Lord Jesus Christ when we see him in heaven. We'll be on level ground with our new glorified bodies and our transfigured, our transfigured bodies, like similar to what Christ had. A lot of theologians teach today. And a lot of people believe that our bodies will have that same type of uh, type of body like Christ had when he was resurrected. So let's read Romans 3 verses 21 through 26. So read it with me if you want to. I'm reading from the New Century Version Bible. The outline in there where we're reading from is how God makes people righteous before him. Or the outline just says how God makes people right. But it means righteous before God, before him. All right. Now, this is what it says. Verse 21 says, But God has a way to make all people stand righteous or right before him without the law. Okay. And God has now shown all of us that way which the law and the prophets have told us all about. 22. God makes all people right with himself through their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is true for all who believe in Jesus Christ, because all people are the same when they stand before him in his presence. doesn't matter if you're small or you're big, meaning rich or poor, or you're popular, or what color you are, because we're all going to be the same standing there right before him naked clothed in white gowns one day as we'll stand in his pure presence after we've been judged. It's all said and done. 23 says, Everyone has sinned and has fallen short of the very glory of God's glorious standards. Or standard, very standard. 24. And all people need to be made whole and righteous before God by his grace. It's a gift that's freely given from God. It's not something you can earn or attain. Just like mercy, just like salvation, just like justification, just like forgiveness. You know, all the Beatitudes, it's not something you earn, it's something that's freely given once you become a new babe in Christ, you know, after you've been baptized. Now let me read on here. So it says, by his grace, Jesus' grace, that's who it was referred to, the one who came here on the cross, it's a foreshadow of that. All right, which is a free hear that? A free gift that comes from God. So you don't get it, it's something he gives you unconditionally. And all these other gifts we've mentioned just a little bit ago. Uh, they need to be made true, or not true, but free from all sin through Jesus Christ. Okay, That's through his blood, is what it's talking about. What's shed on the cross? Uh, God sent Jesus to die in our very place to take away all sins, or our sins. We receive forgiveness through faith, through the blood of Jesus' death on the cross. Right, we alluded to that a little bit ago, so I'm jumping ahead of myself. This showed that God always does what is right and fair, meaning just, as in the past, when God was patient and did not punish people immediately for their sins that they committed. Because there was a he gave forgiveness. That's before Jesus came. But then when Jesus came, we got only for, not only forgiveness, but we got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, that's what it teaches. Um, because that's what happens when you become a baptized believer. Uh, 26 says, And God gave Jesus to show us today, and all the ages till the end of time, that he does what is right and fair and just. God did this so he could judge rightfully, fairly, 
and so that he could make right any person who has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll go to communion, and uh, we will do our sermon body afterwards. Dear Lord, Father God, thank you for us coming before you, as one day we will stand totally naked. Some people think, I think that. Or we'll be wearing robes of white clothes, all dressed the same, won't matter what we look like because we'll all look the same before you and our new bodies. You know, we'll look different, but we'll all be all laid out bare before you in your sight in the end. And we'll be your children. And we'll dwell in your presence face to face one day in heaven. Help us, Lord, to anxiously wait for that time, that wonderful day, joyous day, when we'll be made whole and purified and glorified as we stand before you. Help us, Lord, to understand that that's the ultimate goal. And help us to realize that being in this world is just dropping the bucket like what Grandfather Leland Short would always say compared to eternity, to be with the Lord, which is the best place to be. In Jesus, in your wonderful name, I pray, amen. Let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. We have the bread. It's very small, but it's okay because that represents his presence and this is his blood. That's, that's the grape juice. Some people use wine. You know, you don't have wine, you can get Kool-Aid or grape soda. And you can get a, any kind of cracker. The guy's not going to... You just remember that a cracker is communion. It represents symbolically his presence, being with us. That's what the bread represents. And his symbolic blood that was shed on the cross to cover a multitude of sins. Let's do the bread first. Jesus said unto his disciples, as he says, like unto us, Today, as all Christian believers, as we do this every week as a remembrance, he says, take this, eat of this, therefore I am present with you, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. As he passed around the, the bread, everyone broke off a piece. And as they did, they all took it together. Let's all partake it now. And liken to the bread, which represents his presence with us, his blood which was shed on the cross, which is what we come into contact with when we get baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're dunked under the water, we're symbolically, spiritually buried, we're entombed, just like Jesus was entombed. And then we rise up out of there as a new creature, setting aside or stripping away the old nature of our lives where we were sinful. You know that old nature will sometimes come back, but God says that this blood has the power to take away all sins, and one day we'll take it anew around his table in heaven or around him in his full presence and glory. And as we know, as we partake of this emblem, it serves as a memorial, a memorial for what he's done for us. That's why in the Church of Christ we recite this over and over. That's in Corinthians 11, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 11 through 27 or 23, I do believe. And... Uh, we, we talk, we live the account, I kind of paraphrased it, but it's basically what it covers. So this has, the, this was shed on the cross, this is what happens to you when you get baptized symbolically, the water is the blood of Christ, because this water is prayed over by the church, which makes it holy water, which in a way is his blood that was shed, because that's what it becomes when it's prayed over. Symbolically, it doesn't come like real blood. And that's why we drink this, to remind us of that very fact, that Jesus died for us, for our sins. Let's do this in remembrance of him and let's drink of divine life together. Hey Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Please be with me as a teacher, preacher, and evangelist here at New Hunter Church of Christ. Help me, Lord, to reach his people in the pack with the powerful message of Romans. Where yet we are all sinners and we're all falling people, including myself. We all are covered by our blood. By your blood, when we become in contact through baptism, through immersion, like it's outlined in John and all the Gospels, and even in Acts, where it talks about it, where the apostles have baptized people, they were all dunked. They were all immersed. They were all dunked underwater. They were all brought back into, into the new life and added to your number of the body of Christ, as it's recorded in Scripture. And they were given a place to be at the table and to be in your total presence one day, as long as they stay faithful to your words and to your teaching. I help them, Lord, to remember that great commission.
to tell the word, to preach the word to all the ends of the world, like Sean does at Walmart and everywhere else she goes. She talks to people that are strange about Christ and gives them a track to share them a little bit of seed of what you do that's so wonderful. Thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus' in your wonderful name, I pray, amen. Now notice here for a moment. There was a crowd of many people that were standing there. And each one in this crowd had on a pair of tan slacks and a tan shirt. They had no pockets in there, though, because there was no need for those. So they didn't have to worry about cell phones or anything, or anything like that, because there was no need for them. And then they were also wearing a white cotton tube-like socks. And they had white canvas shoes that they were all wearing. Both men and women were wearing these, and they are all just standing there right before God. Our title of the sermon is Standing on God's Holy Ground, or on God's leveled, level ground, or equal ground. And our scripture we read just moments ago was Romans 3, verses 21 through 26. Now we're going to talk about it, that's what we're doing here. Now, I'm going to tell you about some of these people. This is, um, they were all wearing, at the end, they were all wearing tan slacks and, and uh, pants that matched. No pockets in either the shirt or the pants. White tube, white tube socks and canvas shoes to go with it. So whether you're a man or woman, everybody's wearing this. They're all alive, just standing there in awe and worship and presence of God in heaven. One man or one spirit or soul entered the very dressing room in the hickory freeman, we'll just call it that, or we'll just say in the heavenly shop business. And he was wearing like a you know, a business suit, and was excited. And, and well, then when he exited, he was wearing a tan outfit, just like we described at the very beginning of this. While another man went in with wearing just blue jeans on and some shirt, another one wore a loincloth, and then there was one that was dressed in flowered socks and a silk like shirt. And they all they all would come out of this dressing room in heaven in wearing tan uniform slacks and shirts and white socks and canvas shoes like we described at the beginning of this introduction. Then there was a woman that entered in the same dressing room and changing area and in and she was wearing some outfit that had tasteful very tasteful and modest, expensive kind of um, writing all over. And then another woman had lips, you know, that were on her clothes and cheeks and eyes that were covered, that were colored with an artist type of tapestry of flair. And they both, both came out wearing the same outfit as all the men wore that were tan shirt, tan pants, white socks, and canvas shoes to boot with it. All right. All right. And of course their makeup was all removed, of course. They were just looking like their normal self as they would look when they got up in the morning. But, you know, they were looking pretty, but just with no makeup. Just the way they would look, how we will all appear before God one day. All right. Now, it didn't matter if you were rich or poor, black or white, or if you had brown skin, or if you had yellow skin, or purple skin, or blue skin. But everybody just stood there in a brilliant glow, and they were slow from the very technological 80s and 90s and the information age of 2000s. It didn't matter what time they came from, because they all looked the same, and they all were in the same clothes before, you know, same threads before God. And from the very simpler times of the times before that, to the simple attire of just tan slacks, tan shirts, white tube socks, and white canvas shoes to boot. It says they all looked alike. They were just standing there, right before the creator of the universe, on leveled equal ground. Now, I'm not, that's not what people are going to be wearing, okay? I don't want people to semantics this and say, oh, a well, preacher said well, we're all going to be wearing tan slacks and shirts and white socks. No, that's just, thing, just, just something to give you a picture how we all will be standing there. Don't, we're not going to be wearing that outfit, though. But that's just to give you an idea of what it will look like. It's more way to put it more earthly-like terms. When we get before God in heaven, after we've been judged, uh, that's how it will be. Uh, you know, we'll be able to recognize each other. The Bible says we will. 
Um, checking the time is why I got close there for a second. All right, now, number one, point number one in the sermon says, there is a universal need. And I'm going to explain what that is here. It says, all have sinned, it's one thing we know, and have fallen short. And all have, are caught, because they were caught up in sin, that caused them to fall. Now, Mark, missing, has depleted our spiritual resources. Okay? The Jews had the law, but didn't know how to keep it or maintain it. While the Gentiles had general revelation, had an order, orderly and beautiful world, but they, didn't, they failed to listen to what the law had to say about God. Okay. Each of our sins vary as individuals. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, red, yellow, green, you're all pretty in my sight, pretty in God's sight. But we all have different sins, we all have different temptations, we all have different desires, and we all have different weaknesses. And no preachers are different or exhumed or I mean or are excluded from this. Matter of fact, we do have an example to set, and if we are preachers, we're gonna be judged a little more harshly because we are the people that are supposed to be setting the example. And that's what we have to remember as preachers. And that's what this is speaking to him about too. You know, in here. As we stand right before God, that's what we will be in account of. Says there are soft sins that people tend to think about, like a simple allegiance to, you know, selfish indulgence to myself. It's things I want to do because I'm thinking about myself, not other people. And that's what people tend to think. You know, they're just little different levels of sins and categories. And there are persistent types of sins and weaknesses that we have, that we struggle with on a daily basis. So we like to put them in different categories. But, um, but you know, just listen. And then there are sins of purple passion and lust. And there are violent types of sin. And then there are filthy sins that leave scars on our very lives. And we get haunted by those sins. Like Paul had that thorn. You know, so people tend to put sins in different categories and different compartments, but I'm going to tell you something here in a minute. And then there are protests of no sin that we see out, where people do protest about that, you know, kind of showing that they're just one kind of person, but yet they're still in sin. It's a little secret. They're still doing the sin themselves, even though they preach against it. And if you're going to preach at something, and if I'm going to preach at something, we all have to do what? Not be sinning. When we're preaching against something, we want to make sure we're living right and righteous before God before we start talking about uh, sin, no sin protests. Because really, it's impossible for us not to sin every day. And if it wasn't for Christ, we wouldn't have a chance to be in heaven at all. We would all be destined for hell without the blood. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, you know, that was shed on the cross. Because of his sin... I mean, because of his blood, he took on our sins as believers, as baptized new women and men and children in Christ. He took them because he shed, he, and we died when we were dunked under the water. We're not really dying, but our spirit was symbolically dead and was entombed under the water. When we pulled out, then we were resurrected like Christ was on the third day. But we did that all through the moment, instantaneously through baptism. That's how we identify with Paul, or how we identify with Christ Jesus is by those elements when we get baptized. That's why we have to be dunked. We can't be Christians. We can't be sprinkled. We can't find some kind of enlightenment. Or we can't, you know, just think that we're saved because we're tricked by the Spirit when that's not scriptural. You know, think we're just going to be saved by the Spirit without going in the water. That's not even scriptural or biblical. But people do teach us dogma. All right. Which may be the greatest sin, the greatest test, to God's grace. Nothing drew more fire from Jesus Christ than pride itself. That's the greatest sin of all, is pride. If you are a person that has pride, you need to repent. You need to stop being like that to people. You need to stop thinking you're better than they are. You need to stop manipulating and controlling others and justifying your, your actions. And if you're like this, you need to stop this. And stop saying and making excuses up, blaming other people for your 
mistakes that you make and blaming them instead of you just taking the fall because you did it. You know, when a lot of controlling people have a very big problem with the word pride because that's an issue and that's what's behind all this. And that's why they feel like they have to, you know, have power and authority over others and want to take control and manipulate others and to get other people to turn against them. And if you say something, they get mad because they didn't say it. And then they say you're inappropriate or thinking that. And they treat you like a child. And they say uh, cruel things without thinking about it. Like my friend did this weekend, which I think was totally rude and disrespectful. I've been nothing good, good to her. I've always been this way. I don't do things deliberately. I just love seeing the kids and the kids talk to me like I talk to them. And sometimes, yeah, I'm a little bit getting out of the door because they ask me questions. That's what they do. And there's nothing wrong with that because they love me and I love them. And I love Sean and Charlie too. But I don't like it when somebody says something that I do it deliberately because that's the way she came across because she's mad because she got all worn down by talking to all these people. She didn't really spend much time with me. I'm a company. I'm coming to see her. I'm a company I should be getting more priority. Not all these people that are calling in. She can talk to them tomorrow or today. You know, she don't need to talk to them on Sunday when she has company over. I wouldn't do that. If people call me, I wouldn't answer the phone when they're there. If I have company, I'm an entertaining guest. I will not answer the phone. You know, if it's uh, during supper time or during the evening hour, you know, if I have guest over, I'm not going to answer the phone. I might check it, and I just can call them back later. But that's what you have to do. So get rid of pride. That's one thing that kills your chance to be in heaven with the Lord. It kills your chance to be an attorney with Jesus. If that's a pride, if it's an issue that you beseech you that you keep doing, you will be alienated from Christ because of your transgression and you're not letting it go and saying you're better than everybody else. When you have pride, that's how you come across. Get rid of that. If you're like that this morning, stop it. Point number two, if there is a universal promise that God has given us, and when there is, God will be just and fair. Sin will be punished, or those people that commit sin will be punished if they don't repent. There's consequences, both for good and for sins, for people that commit sins. Now, there has or there had been a pushing back or maybe you could say a delay and punishment, awaiting for God's perfectly designed answer. And the answer came through the Lord Jesus Christ, who came here to die on the cross for us, for you and I, who are Christian believers born again, baptized, like the way John, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Oh, I want to say something about sins up here. All sins, before we go on, when I did the introduction, you know, when I talked about sins, all sins are the same in God's eyes. You know, no matter how we compartmentalize sins, they are all the same. There's no big sins, even though we like to think of that. There's small sins, no. They are all the same in God. If you tell a lie, that's just damnable as fornicating with some girl or some boy or some man or some woman. And if you're if you're married, it's adultery. It's wrong. Uh, and, and it's just as damnable. There's no different levels. There's no different areas. There's no gray areas. However, we like to put things in different areas but that of light, but that's not what the scriptures teach. All sins are just as damnable if, they're not, if you don't repent. You know you sin daily, so you need to repent daily. That's what the scriptures teach. That's not what I teach. It's not me saying. Okay? All right. So there have been a pushing back or delay. We've already read that. It came through, the, came through, the divine answer was through the Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. We also know that the law had exposed all lawbreakers and also had crucified the violation or violations for those sins through the blood and the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, and it also told us that there are responsibilities that we need to follow. Okay? Now, point number C. If there were to be any hope of reunion between God and his people, then it would have to be up to God himself. Only God has the necessary 
power to do this. Nothing else can do this. Even though Satan might say he can do something, he's a liar. Only God can truly take away your sins and truly can restore you. Nothing else can. Even if it says they can, nothing else can but Jesus Christ. Only God can do it. Now, it would be, um, it would have to, we would have to honor him and worship him. You know, because he has a just and divine nature. And it also would give and show all the evidence of his very mercy for us as humanity who are born in Christ Jesus. Point number three, there is a universal offer that is given by God. Things can be made whole and right before God. That's the, you know, and the offer is the hope that comes from God through his divine and innate nature. And that's how we have hope in Christ, because that comes from Jesus. That's where it comes from originally. And love comes from Jesus. It also comes to everyone who believes in him and calls on his name. There's no distinction in your color, your skin, your size, or your class. Vacation, whether you're poor or rich or middle class. There's no difference no matter what you are. If you're heavy, if you're skinny, if you're fat, or if you're short or tall, or midget, or wharf, it doesn't matter. All right. God still, the standards are all still the same for everyone. There is a universal means how this will be carried out. Jesus Christ, by God's grace, is words freely given from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, or Christ, through and by his blood that was shed on the cross. Jesus Christ, when we totally put our trust totally in him. Now, in conclusion, or summation, everything that we talked about this morning, I want you to listen here. There is the very boasting that is found in Romans 3, verse 27, which we can bounce over here and read that real quick. It says, so, do we have a reason to brag or boast about ourselves or about anything that we have achieved? The answer is absolutely not. Okay, We should be more concerned about God. It says, why not? Why can't we talk about ourselves? Why can't we brag about ourselves? Because it doesn't build the church up. It tears the church down. It does not help to bring people together in a cohesive community or or congregation. We need to give glory to God. We need to edify people and lift people up. That's why you go to church. Not to tear people down by all your achievements and titles and clearances and what you've done in your life. The drawing people tend, because they're very prideful, like to always be in the spotlight. And always like to shed or share their achievements. Because they love to talk about themselves. But what they end up doing is they end up being selfish. And they forget about other people. Because all they worry about is just telling everybody about what they've done. And they don't care really. They appear or come across like they don't care about other people. And that's a real turn off to God as it is for other people. So if you're like that, please stop doing it. It says, it is the way of faith that we have in Jesus Christ. That all that that stops all boasting and or bragging. It is not the way of trying to obey the law, but it's how it's our way of following God's law because we want to serve him. That's what I should add on to that verse. Because we love him. That's why we follow the law. Not the man's made law, but his word is his law. The true divine law comes from Scripture. And we follow His law because we simply want to be obedient unto Him. It's not a work that we do, but it's because we want to serve Him because we want to follow Him because we love Him. So it's no part on our part. God doesn't hold a gun to your head and says, You better believe in me. He didn't do that, Paul. He doesn't do that to each of us. We make a choice because we have free will. Some people don't believe that, but it's crazy not to because everything you do, you have to decide. Well, it's just like coming to God. You have to make a choice. You either can believe in him or you can follow the world and end up in hell. Or you can follow him and repent and have a relationship with him and be with him in eternity in heaven. It's really that simple. It's really that cut and dry. So it's either one or the other. You can't serve both. Because the other is, God is very jealous, very just. He doesn't like people to serve anything else but him or anything else. Uh, so if you're doing that, you need to stop doing that. But God always center and foremost in your life. And everything else will come together as long as he's always first and up in front and center. Before your family, before your wife, 
or your family, I meant to say, and in your job. God should always be first before any of those other things. Okay? All those things are secondary, but God is primary. The government is secondary. I hate to say that even though they think they're God too, but really they're not. They're just people, just like you and I. Sinful, corrupt, fallen people. But God is the one that gives us eternal grace, love, faith, hope, for forgiveness, salvation, justification, and any, and any other gift I discernment, gentleness, meekness, righteousness, wisdom. True wisdom comes from God. Not the wisdom of this world that's counterfeit, but the real wisdom comes from God that Samuel had. And like we, you and I can have, you pray for it. That's what you really want to seek after. God will give it to you. He will. If you ask him, he will. I want to say from reading what we read, there isn't any, I lay my very accomplishments all aside, beside those, you know, I put them aside and I just put Christ in the forefront, like I was just saying. Christ should always be in the center, or synergy, and algebra they call it, synergy is the center. Nothing else can be there except him. And everything else is secondary. All your accomplishments are great, but they're not going to matter anything in heaven. It doesn't matter what kind of title you have. It doesn't matter what class you came from. Paul had the highest education You know, when he was Saul of Tarsus. He had the best education of that day that money could buy. He came from a very rich, rooted family that was in the Roman Empire and in the Roman and Jewish law. He knew everything about that. He was surrounded. He grew up in it. He grew up with the, some of the most influential people of his day you know, that were in the law that day. But that didn't matter because in Christ it doesn't matter. So all that stuff that we have has to be put aside. Christ can only be the one that's in the center. The only one that gets all the credit and all the glory. Nothing else or no one else can get it but only him. All right. It also says, I hear the very challenge that God and Christ has laid before me or given me. It says, now... Now brag, okay? Meaning, don't brag, because God says not to do that. It's not, it's not, it's not productive. It's counterproductive. It doesn't help. It doesn't bring people for Christ or bring people close to Christ or near to Christ. So therefore, I stand there, wearing my tan outfit that God has given me. You know, as I stand there naked, which I think we're going to be naked before God anyway, originally, because there won't be no sin in heaven. So it won't matter if we wear a white gown or not. Because we're not going to have genitalia up there because our bodies will be different. We won't need to go to the bathroom. So we won't need sex organs up there. The only reason why we have them here is for, on this earth, is to have children. And that's why God gave us genitalia, to create an offspring, to keep the human line going. But in heaven, you won't need that. So we'll be under a whole different set of rules. And therefore, if we are naked, even though John says we clothed with white gowns, we might be, but it may look that way because we're so radiant and our spirit will be radiant just like God and his light will be all around us. So we might all appear totally white and glowing just like God does because God, being in his power and glory, may be why 